Okay, um, this morning we're going to begin our study, or not begin, continue our study on, on 2 Thessalonians. Uh, last week we finished chapter 1, we got into chapter 2, and we got a couple of, got into a couple of the verses, and we got down um, to the, down to verse 3, where it says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, that day referring to the second coming of Christ, that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. And that's where we ended. We ended with the falling away. We didn't get to the, to the man of sin. We're going to talk about him a little bit today. Um, well, not a little bit today. We're going to talk about him all day today, and we might talk about him a little bit next week, um, who this man of sin is. Let's go ahead. Let's read verses 3 um, down to verse... down to verse 12. We're going to read three, from verse 3 down to verse 12. We're not going to get that far this morning, but I want you to be familiar with the flow, okay? Um, so we're talking, well, let's just start, let's just read the chapter from verse 1 down to verse 12. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. No man, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. I think you can see why we ain't going to get all that way through that this morning. There's a lot in there. There's a ton of stuff in there. Okay, this man of sin answers to what we read over in 1 John chapter 2, verses 18 and 19. Where John says, Little children, it is the last time. As ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now there are many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. Okay? That's who this is talking about. Paul here is talking about the, the person that will be known as the Antichrist, or is known as the Antichrist. Now the prefix anti means opposite, against, in exchange, instead, representing, rivaling, simulating. Okay, that's what an anti-aircraft gun is a gun that you use to shoot at airplanes with, right? That's what anti, it's, it's, it, it, so it's, if, if, if you've, an anti, is it a venom? Well, if you get bit by a anti-venom, anti, same thing, uh, you get bit by a rattlesnake, you get anti-venom to take care of the problem. Anti is the, is the opposite type of a thing, and, and those aren't, neither of those are good explanations, but, you get the point. That's what anti is. It's the opposite of it. We're going to see another one of those uh, here in just a few minutes. But uh, the Antichrist is 
would be the opposite. In other words, there's a Christ that is coming that will simulate and yet rival the true Christ. He's going to pretend to be Christ, and yet he's going to be against Christ. Okay, that's the Antichrist. Um, now John also connects the rise of this Antichrist with apostasy. And you remember what we studied last week. Two things that are going to happen. There's going to be a great falling away, and that's the word that we get apostasy from. There will be a great apostasy that happens, and then the man of sin will, will show up. Okay, so the, one of the questions I asked was, has that happened yet? I'm going I'm to, I think I'm going to show you that it hasn't happened yet. That there have been a lot of people that think it has, but I think that I can prove to you this morning that that's not the case. Um, and that's why it's going to be fun for me, because I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to prove that. Um, John says here that they went out from us, that the Antichrist went out from us. So that is, they fell away, right? They fell away from the truth. They went out from us. Um, and Antichrists come out from among true believers. A couple of passages. Acts chapter 20, verses 29 and 30, where Paul says, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. And 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1 says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So a time is coming when there will be a great falling away, and when that happens, this man of sin will be revealed. Um, and you know, there's, there's, there's a point that I have to make here also. You, you wonder about people that, that come into the church and then they leave, and, and we've made the point over and over again that some of them, they come in, they leave, they didn't belong here. They shouldn't have been here to start with. Some of them, other things, but, but a lot of times they shouldn't, they got in, under a false pretense, and they shouldn't have been here to begin with. Um, look at Galatians chapter 2. And verse 4. Where Paul says, And because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us unto bondage. You see, there are those that come into the church with false, as false brethren, with, with their own agenda. Um, look at Acts chapter 2. This may help explain a part of a verse that seems a little bit obscure at sometimes. Acts chapter, we're, we're talking about the baptism, those that, were, that gladly received the word were baptized, and there were about 3,000 souls that one day. And in verse 47, it says, Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. When we baptize someone, we add them to the church. What if they're a false brethren? God doesn't add them to the church. He adds to the church the ones that should be saved, the ones that are actually his children. The false ones, they're on our roll sheet until they go out and we exclude them or whatever, but, but God never adds them. He doesn't add people that aren't his children to his church. So we baptize, we, I go out and baptize 3,000 people and 2,000 of them are, are not really the elect. God's only going to add to the church on the rolls in heaven the thousand that are. He adds to the church those such as should be saved. So if that verse has ever caused you any problems before, there's the uh, there's the answer to that one. Um, so false brethren enter into the church and they provoke deflections from the truth. In one way or another they cause, they cause problems for the rest of us. Um, and had these apostates been of the saints, they wouldn't have left. 
I mean, let's face it, if, if doing what God wants is the most important thing in the world, why would you leave? Okay? Um, never to, to return. Okay, now here's, here's something that I spent a lot of time on, and I hope it doesn't take me forever to get through it, but it says in verse 3 that that man of sin and that man of sin be revealed revealed. That word is used three times in passing on this same guy in this same passage. The word revealed. In verse 6 it says, and now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. And then we see in verse 8, and then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume. So he uses this word three times. It's always the same Greek word in these passages. There are many different words that are used that are translated revealed. But in these passages, he, it uses the same word. Now the word revealed in English means disclosed, discovered, made known, laid open. Okay? Disclose is to uncover, to open, to remove a cover from and lay open to the view. Discovered is uncovered, disclosed to view, laid open, revealed, despised, or first seen, found out, detected. So all of, the, all of those definitions appear to have something to do with taking the cover off of something, right? You pull the cover off of something, then you can see it. Um, the Greek word that's translated revealed here is apocalypto which comes from apo, which is a prefix like anti would be a prefix, but we just talked about antichrist, um, and calupto. Um, apo as a prefix denotes separation, departure, cessation, completion, or reversal of something. So it's kind of, kind of like the Greek form of anti, if you will. Um, calupto means to cover up or to hide. So, apocalypto means to remove the covering. Same thing that, that the English word means. Take the cover off of it, okay? Um, calupto is a compound word as, as well. It, it comes from klepto, um, which actually means to filch, which is, again, to like, I think to rub something off, rib, strip it off. Something So, removing the cover again, um, it also means to steal. People will use, a kleptomaniac is someone that can't help themselves, they steal all the time. Um, so, so that's removing something, right? Whatever it is that you're taking and putting in your pocket when you're in the store, that you're removing it from the store. Um, and, it, and crypto, which means to conceal by covering. So, all of this indicates that Apocalypto means to take the cover off. To remove a cover from something so you can see it. Okay? And we're told that this man of sin will be revealed. And as we get farther on, we're going to see who this man of sin is going to be revealed to. We get down to those last verses where it talks about those that receive not the love of the truth, God sends delusion. Those that receive the love of the truth, those that are faithful, those that are God's children, the man of sin will be revealed to them. So, I, I, I'm going to chase a rabbit, I think. Um, any of you ever heard of a guy by the name of Hal Lindsey? Heard of Hal Lindsey? Some of you? Um, he got rich and became famous because back when I was a kid, he wrote a book called The Late Great Planet Earth. You ever heard of that? It's all about the premillennial ideas of the end times, explaining how everything's going to play out and what's going to happen this week and what's going to happen that week. And, and as soon as this starts, then this is going to happen. And, and the guy became a multi-gazillionaire by writing that book. And I've given a lot of thought to this over the years. Um, and I discussed that, this with Wendy this morning. Um, 
You want to know how to become a millionaire as a minister? Basic marketing. Marketing 101. You want to be a millionaire as a minister. Okay? Develop a system that explains prophecy and write a book about it. You go to a Bible bookstore and there are aisles full of pro prophetic books on the end times. It's the number one seller in a Christian so-called bookstore. Books about prophecy. You write a book explaining how the end is going to happen and you will sell a bazillion copies of it and be now if you want to be an honest an honest minister the way you become a millionaire is you start with two million and give it time. <laughs> it was the same same way with real estate appraisers. If you start with two million and you're patient, within 15, 20 years, you'll be down to one. So that's that's how you become a millionaire as an honest minister. But if you if you want to be one of these charlatan guys and make a lot, that's all you gotta do. Just write a book, explain with a new theory on end times, and get Zondervan to publish it for you, and you'll be rich. It's, you look at these guys, the televangelist guys that have done this, and that's where, that's where they always, there was, there was one guy I was, I told this to Wendy too, it, it, um, it proves, this story is going to prove that God has a sense of humor. There was a guy by the name of, I think it was Irwin, Irwin Banks maybe, um, he was a minister, started as an evangelist when he was 19, then became a, a pastor when he was 26, and he pastored a church up in Illinois, and then he finally started a, an organization called End Time Ministries, and uh, moved to Plano, Texas, and became a televangelist and made a ton of money. Um, because he was talking about end times, that's what these, that's, uh, I'll get to that. Anyway, back last March when the coronavirus thing started, he he came out. He was on the Jim Baker show, and he came out and and uh, and said that the coronavirus was a warning from God against illicit fornication. I guess all fornication is illicit, but premarital sex or adultery or fornicate, whatever that God was punishing these people for their wicked acts by giving them the coronavirus. Okay? In November he died of COVID-19. So if you don't think that God has a sense of humor, <laughs> oops. <laughs> so anyway, here's, now here's the reason. This is the reason that you could become a millionaire by talking about end time stuff. Because everybody wants to know what's going to happen in the future. Everybody wants to know that. Nobody serious, well, very few people seriously want to know what they have to do to enter into fellowship with God and live a godly life. You try to s preach godly to them, yeah, I'm not so interested in that. What's going to happen next week? Everybody wants that. So since that's your market, if you sell to that, you play to that market, you'll get rich. That's how it works. Um, and that's why the churches are so small. The ones that where we, where we pound doctrine and try to teach truth and try to teach you what to do. Most people don't want, they don't have time for that. We don't have time for that. We want to know who the Antichrist is. You go take a look at this stuff. People have been trying to predict this guy since the dawn of Christianity. And, and I want you to pay attention to something here. Look at verse 6. And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. In his time. You want to know why we don't know who the Antichrist is? It ain't his time yet. When it is his time, you're going you're gonna to know who he is. We don't need to spend all of our time running around trying to figure out who this guy is. Because we're on a need-to-know basis here, folks. And when we need to know, we're going to know. So we, we don't need to worry about that. Let's, let's, let me prove this. Look at a couple of other verses where this same Greek word is used. And see if I can't prove my point. Look at 1 Peter 
chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Any of you know what heaven looks like? No. Do any of us know what it's going to look like when Christ returns and we get our glorified bodies? And we, do we, any, any of us know what that is? No. It hasn't been revealed yet. It'll be revealed then. When the time happens and then it's time to know, you're going to know. I, I've got a pretty good idea that once I have a glorified body and I'm walking around in the new heavens and the new earth, I'm going to know what it looks like. I'm going to know what things smell like, what things taste like. I'm going to know that stuff. But until I get there, and nobody's going to get there until the end, it hadn't been revealed yet. He hasn't taken the cover off of this stuff yet. He's let us peek through the corner of the sheet a little bit, but he hasn't pulled the cover off. Once he takes the cover off, then we're going to see it. The same way with this character, the Antichrist. Look at Galatians chapter 3. Galatians 3 and verse 23, where Paul says, But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith which should afterwards be revealed. In the Old Testament times, Christ was in there, but he hadn't been fully revealed yet. It wasn't until the New Testament times came to explain a lot of that stuff back in the Old Testament that then revealed to those that had the, the ability to understand who he was. The cover was taken off. And those that had the ability, God's children, could see it. If you're not one of God's children, you can't see it. It'll never be revealed to you. When the time comes that the Antichrist comes out, the children of God are going to recognize him. They're going to, oh, there he is. And those that aren't the children of God are going to think he's Christ Almighty. And they're going to run to Jerusalem to worship him. That's just how it's going to work. Okay? Um, look at Luke chapter 10. You know, for, I mean, for years, this has been the thing that, that, that has haunted people. I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard people try to guess who this guy is by taking 666 and counting up all the numbers of the letters in his name or looking at it from this direction or that direction and wondering what the mark of the beast is. And uh, Folks, don't worry about any of that. Let me put your mind at ease, okay? If you're one of God's elect, there's nothing you can do to stay out of heaven. Nothing. Take the mark of the beast. If you're one of God's elect, either if you can't, ta if, you, if you take it, you don't go to heaven, you're never going to have the opportunity. God will never put it in front of you. So, don't be afraid of some vaccination or some this or that thinking it's the mark of the beast. It's not. Because if, if a child of God takes the mark of the beast and they, and they end up lost, they're never going to get it. It's never going to happen. God will stand in the way. Christ says that no man shall pluck you out of my hand. So, and that includes you. You can't even do it. So don't waste a minute worried about that kind of stuff. I know a lot of people, get, they, you get, there's times when you get freaked out. Could this be it? I don't know. But I believe that at the end, when the time comes, we're going to know what it is. We're going to see it. God's children, it's going to be revealed to them. And as we continue on, I hope I can convince you of that so that you can put your mind at ease and not worry about all this other stuff. Luke chapter 10, verse 21. 
In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes, even so, Father, for it seemed good in thy sight. Now, does this not line up with what we read over in Thessalonians? That the man of sin will be revealed, and to those that don't receive the love of the truth, they will receive delusion so that they won't see it. It'll be hidden from them. The only people that are going to spot this guy as the Antichrist are God's children. Those that aren't God's children are going to believe that this guy is Christ himself. And I've and I got, I, I got a hint for you I'm going to give you in just a second that I, I got years and years ago from, from Elder Mott. And, and, and it fits. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Verses 6 through 10. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. This is the reason that so few people see the truth. It's not revealed to them. It's hidden from them. There's a cover over it. They can't see it. It's like when they're, they, it, it, in a passage it talks about uh, back when Moses was around, I think it's over in Hebrews somewhere, that there was a veil over the people's face. They couldn't, they couldn't see anything because of this veil. It was cover, covering it. But then once that veil's removed, once the covering's taken off, now you can, now you can see it. I, I have to laugh. We, the other day we were in the bank. bank some, I said this earlier, so some of you have already heard it. It's a repeat. But we were in the bank the other day, and Wendy had on, had on her sunglasses. And Josh looked across and said, you know, you look like the invisible man. Because so, <laughs> you had to wear a mask, right? <laughs> But see, when you take that off, then all of a sudden you can, you can see. And that's how it will be revealed. Um, now, how might he be revealed? Okay, we're just going to look at some exercise. Let's just play with this a little bit and see how he might be revealed. I'll give you a hint. I covered part of it last week when I pointed out that there are eight beasts and not seven. Okay. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 and 52. This is speaking of the second coming. It says, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, and that's not Donald, that's the horn kind, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So at the last trump, at the end, when the trumpet sounds, the dead in Christ will rise first, and we will be changed. We will receive a glorified body at that time. So those of us that are still alive will be glorified on the spot. Those that were dead will receive their body when they come up and, and Christ is bringing their soul and spirit with them, as we're going to see in another passage. Okay? Look at um, Matthew chapter 24. In verse 31, where Christ says, And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. Sound familiar? We're just talking about a trump, right? The last trump. 
And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Second coming. Okay. Now look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Verses 15 through 18. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. And that word prevent actually means to proceed. Um, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, same event, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. This sounds just like over in 1 Corinthians. Okay. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Okay? How might the Antichrist be revealed? Well, if someone tells you that Christ has returned and is setting up his kingdom in Jerusalem, and your feet haven't left the ground, it ain't him. It's that simple. That's not him. When he comes and you're one of his elect, even if you're disobedient, if you're one of his elect, when he returns, you're out of here and you're never coming back. So if somebody comes along and says, hey, Jesus is in Jerusalem? Yeah, not so much. Not that Jesus. Maybe the anti-Jesus. And as I pointed out briefly last week, and, and Elder Gerald is the one that first introduced me to this idea, and he might be right. I don't know it hadn't happened yet. But his thinking was that there would be a false antichrist that would mirror the Schofield Bible, and then the real antichrist would fake a second coming because everybody knows that the that Christ is supposed to destroy an antichrist when he comes back so put a fake antichrist in there and then the real antichrist comes and destroys the fake one and rules from Jerusalem and guess what he's the real antichrist he's the man of sin he's the wicked one that well that shall be revealed now, if that's the way it plays out, and I don't know if that's how it'll play out or not, but if it is, that could reveal him to the folks that know. To the folks that know that when Christ returns, I'm out of here. I'm not out of here yet, so either A, I'm not a child of God, and it really doesn't matter because it's over for me, or B, that's not the real, that's not the real guy. One or the other. Um, so that's how he might be. So, I'm telling you this for, for this reason. Our time on this earth will be much better spent living in obedience to God's commandments, studying His Word, how to better serve Him, than worrying about who the Antichrist is, or worrying about what the mark of the beast is, or worrying about any of this other nonsense. I don't mean nonsense from the, from the sense of it you, under, you get my point. It's something you don't need to be concerned with. You really don't. Um, you know, Solomon, when he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, he had tried everything possible, it seems, uh, to try to make sense from a human perspective of some of the things that we, that we find in the world. And he had the money to do it. And he was able to go, oh, I'll go try this for a while. I'll go try that for a while. I'll go try something else for a while. And he went out and tried it all. And in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 13, he comes to this conclusion. He says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Here, I've tried it all. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. That's your duty. Those are your marching orders. And don't worry about all this peripheral stuff. You know, one, one, of, the, one of the problems with a lot of this is this stuff can change instantly. You know, this, these people, these things, this stuff morphs into other stuff, it, more so than a coronavirus does. So, since we're to comfort you with these words, 
take comfort in the fact that you don't need to worry about this. When the day comes, he'll be revealed and you'll see him. And if you go before then, well then you don't have to worry about it at all. Okay? Um, now, the next thing that we see in our passage, um, in, in verse, uh, verse 3 again, you have the falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. He calls him the son of perdition. Perdition is the fact or condition of being destroyed or ruined, utter destruction, complete ruin. Okay? There's someone else called that. Look at John chapter 17. John chapter 17 and verse 12. In the wrong chapter, here we go. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Judas Iscariot was the son of perdition. He was known as the son of perdition. Look at Luke chapter 22. Luke 22, verses 3 through 6. Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. And he went his way and communed with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him unto them. And they were glad and covenanted to give him money. And he promised um, and sought opportunity to betray him unto, the, uh, unto them in the absence of the multitude. So Judas is the guy that betrayed Christ. And the Antichrist is just like Judas Iscariot. Remember I said he would be a Christ, but he would be against Christ? Just like Judas Iscariot was against Christ. And don't be surprised if this guy, when he shows up, is, is, is a humanitarian. Don't be surprised by that. Judas Iscariot was. Look at John chapter 12. You'll remember, you'll remember there was a time when, when um, Mary, uh, Lazarus' sister, um, uh, anointed Christ with oil. And in verse 12, Judas, um, I think it's verse 12, let me check again. No, it's verse 4. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him. Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? Why'd you just waste all this ointment? Why'd you, we could have sold this and we could have helped poor people with it. See, he was a humanitarian. This he said not that he cared for the poor. And you know what? Most humanitarians don't care for the poor either. They do all this stuff to look good in the, in the eyes of somebody else. But because he was a thief and had the bag and bear what was put therein. Okay? Now a humanitarian, is the noun form, is a person who seeks to promote human welfare. A philanthropist. And a philanthropist is a person who seeks to promote the welfare of others, especially by the generous donation of money to good causes. It never, it never shot, I mean, I'm, I'm always, I guess I'm not, I'm not amazed. It, you watch these philanthropist type of guys, they give billions of dollars to whatever cause it is, but Bloomberg, he's one of them. A bunch of them have run for president, not many of them have made it, but a bunch of these philanthropist kind of guys have run for, they want power. And they give their money away so that they can buy power. That's what Bloom, well, how much did Bloomberg spend billions this last time around and got five votes or something like that? He was trying to buy his way in. Um, now, another point about our man of sin here. 
it says, verse 4, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. He's going to exalt himself above all that's called God and claim total sovereignty. Okay? In other words, this is going to be a totalitarian ruler over the entire world. Hadn't been revealed yet, has he? We haven't seen one of those yet. We've seen guys try it, but they haven't gotten there yet. Because it's not his time yet. Satan's been on this, he's been trying to do this since the very beginning. This is nothing new. And he'll lift somebody, and you know what, I'm going to tell you something, he doesn't know who it is yet either. So he, he's going to keep promoting people and, and try to do it. Adolf Hitler, I'm sure that that was his design, but he wasn't it. It wasn't his time yet. Charlemagne, way back when, tried to take over. There, there's been successive of these guys trying to, Napoleon, all these guys that are trying to take over the world so that they can rule the world, well, someday it's going to work. And he'll be revealed to us. We'll know who he was. He's going to pose as God, and yet he will oppose God, which makes him Antichrist by definition. And he will sit in the temple of God. Now, I don't know if that means Jerusalem or if that means what. I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm not, and I'm not going to go out on a limb and say... I don't know. Um, but there is a point I want you to think about. That is that adherence of premillennialism, premillennialism, um, erroneously teach that Christ is going to come to a rebuilt Jewish temple in Jerusalem. It's one of their tenets. Beware of a future Christ on this earth in the temple of God. Because, like I said earlier, if Christ returns to set up this temple, you're out of here. You're not going to be here. If you see a Christ setting up shop in a something that looks like a temple, it's not the Christ that you're interested in. Okay? We already looked at that passage. Okay. Satan's program for this man of sin is called the mystery of, in, of iniquity, and it's already at work. Um, we see that in verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way. Now, mystery of iniquity agrees with what, what we read over in in, you don't need to turn here. First John chapter 2 and verse 18, which says, Even now there are many antichrists. This, a mystery is a secret or a hidden thing. His mystery of iniquity, Satan's, it's, it's hidden, hidden from us. But, um, and a lot of the things that Satan's been involved in are hidden. They're secret. Um, secret orders conspiracies, the Illuminati, the Masonic Lodge, the all of this other stuff that's hidden from those that haven't gone through the rites and haven't been initiated into the club. Um, that's how Satan works. Um, and this is one of the problems with conspiracies. The guy that's running the conspiracies is the devil and he can morph them anytime he wants to. If people start getting wind of what's going on, he'd just change it, and now it's something completely different. And you're never going to chase it down. You spend your whole life trying to chase one of these things down, you'll never chase it down. It'll change on you. And, and the amount of time that you will spend chasing down a conspiracy could have been spent reading the Word of God paying attention to truth, trying to live in obedience rather than getting involved. I know that I know that stuff's seductive. I know it is. Um, it's like Facebook. When I realized what a time suck Facebook was, 
I'm no, I'm no longer there. I'm no longer on any social media because all it does is waste time. Time that can be spent in a better way. Now some people can get, they can get away with it and it doesn't intrigue them as much as it does others. But there were, there were days when I'd get on that thing, I'd be there for weeks. So best to do away with it. Um, if you're one that can handle it, fine, handle it. I'm, you know, this is one of those things that you just have, you got to know, a man must know his limitations. Clint Eastwood. Um, we're, well, okay, we're back to the conspiracy. To conspire means to combine pri privily for an evil or unlawful purpose. To agree together to do something criminal, illegal, or reprehensible. Um, and it's done privately. And that's the way that Satan has done this stuff. Believe me, the people at the top know who they're working for. The folks at the top know who they're working for in this. They're not deceived. They know exactly who they're working for and they know what they're going for and they know what they're trying to do. Um, Nancy Pelosi may play dumb. She ain't that dumb. She just comes off that dumb. Now, there is, there is a, here is one conspiracy that I will agree with that's important. Look at Ezekiel chapter 22. Beginning at verse 25. There is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof, like a roaring lion ravening the prey. They have devoured souls, they have taken the treasure and precious things, they have made her many widows in the midst thereof. Her priests have violated my law and have profaned mine holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and profane, Neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean, and have hid their eyes from my Sabbaths, and I have pr am profaned among them. Her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves ravening the prey to shed blood and to destroy souls, to get dishonest gain. And her prophets have daubed them with untempered mortar, uh, seeing vanity and divining lies unto them, saying, Thus saith the Lord God, when the Lord hath not spoken. The people of the land have used oppression and exercised robbery and have vexed the poor and needy. Yea, they have oppressed the stranger wrongfully and I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before, uh, before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I have found none. Therefore I have poured out mine indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, saith the Lord God. That was at a time that he had gotten so fed up with the Jews that he sent Nebuchadnezzar to destroy Jerusalem and to carry the Jews captive. Because there was a conspiracy amongst the religious people of the land against God. Do you not see one today? Do you not see a conspiracy by religious people that is absolutely against God? I see it. In any day that I walk around Lake Hollingsworth, I see it. There's that big, huge church with a steeple on the top of it, First Presbyterian with a cross at the top of it. Go in there and find out what they think about Jesus Christ. Go see it, who it is that they're worshiping and what they're teaching their people. And I can guarantee you the guy standing in the pulpit in there knows exactly what he's saying. He knows Greek and Hebrew 15 times better than I do. He knows English better than I do. He knows what this book says. He doesn't believe it. And so he's teaching something contrary to it. And he's got a whole bunch of buddies and privily, they've formed a conspiracy to trap God's children in a false religion. 
And so they spend their times telling everybody, don't worry about it, you're good, everybody's good, everything's fine. And they don't ever preach on anything that'll rub any feathers the wrong way. Just to keep you trapped. Just like, just like Paul said, that I know that after my departing, grievous wolves shall enter in. Even some of you, not you, but he, I'm using his, his language, even among some of you, even some of the, those people that he was talking to, he could see that they were going to end up being wolves as well. You know, they, it happens. There, so there is a conspiracy against God's religion. And what was happening then was happening in Peter's time too. Look at uh, Second Peter. Chapter 2 and verse 1. But there were false prophets also among the people. We just looked at some of them. Even as there shall be false teachers among you. Who privily, there's that word again. Shall bring in damnable heresies even denying the Lord that bought them. And bring, swift, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. You see, there, was, there were false teachers. There's false teachers today just like there were back then. And one of the things that I find in, interesting, and I've made this point before, um, when I did the study on Elijah, Mount Carmel, they called together, there were 400, I think it was 450 prophets of Baal, and another 400 false prophets um, that sat at Jezebel's court and one man of God. 850 to 1. And those odds are just about right. So even as there were false prophets, there shall be false teachers. 850 to 1 seems just about right. May actually be lower. I mean, you know, it may be 4,000 to 1, I don't, but, but the point being, there are going to be numerous false teachers for every real one you got out there. There's going to, I already told you why. You want to be a millionaire in religion? Go come up with some end time story and write a book about it and go on the television circuit. You don't believe it anyway, so what difference does it make? It's, to these guys, it's just, they might as well be telling a story about Humpty Dumpty. They don't believe any of this stuff, so they... Okay. Um, now, the conspiracy over in Ezekiel involved ministers of religion, it involved political leaders, and it involved the people. Okay. And it belong and it begins with the prophets, the teachers of religion. And it says that first the souls are devoured and then the treasures. You see, they destroy the people's faith first. Then they get the money. And the, in this conspiracy, the distinction between truth and error and right and wrong are blurred. They make no difference between the profane and the honorable. The false teaching leads to oppression. And a conspiracy carries with it the seeds of its own destruction. Now here's the interesting part. God's already told us sacred, say, that, uh, Satan's secret. We know his secret. We know how he, how he works. Um, in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Now we're talking about Satan's mystery of iniquity. This is the counter to it. 
Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Satan has worked throughout history to erase this mystery of godliness and replace it with his mystery of iniquity and his man of sin. And someday he'll get there. And we'll cover how that happens. Um, we'll get into that next week. Um, as we're going to continue a little, uh, uh, still working with him, but we're going to get into this first where it says, talks about this mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Um, I'll tell you who that's the Holy Spirit is the he that who letteth now and will the old English word let actually means to hinder I don't want to get too far into this because if I do then we're going to be here for an hour as I try to piece this together but I'll just give you this as the trailer okay um, let actually means to hinder to prevent um, to obstruct that's the primary meaning of the word there's a secondary meaning of the word which means to allow but the primary meaning, the primary sense, means to hinder, and the Greek word follows along with the same thing. So he who now, you know, this, this is interesting. This is one of the things back in 1880, here goes a rabbit for you. Back in 1880, when, the, um, when they wanted to revise the King James Version of the Bible, and they hired Westcott and Hort and all those other guys to make these revisions. The revisions were supposed to do things like that verse where it says, he who now letteth will let. Well, we don't, that's not what we, how we use that word anymore. So change it to make it contemporary. That's what they wanted done. And what they got was something completely different because that ties right back into that conspiracy that's against God's church again. But that was really, that was, that's what was sold to the people that they, were, that they were doing. They were going to go in and take the words that meant the opposite and switch them back around so that you could read it and not have to go get a dictionary out and look it up. And, and they, got, they got sold a bag of goods, but that's for, another, that's for another time. Okay, so um, he that now letteth will let until he be taken out of the ways. There will come a day and I'll cover this in greater detail next week. There will come a day when God just takes his hands off the reins. I mean, right now he's, he's pulling back on them, keeping things restrained. But there's going to come a day where he's just going to let them go. And then that man of sin will be revealed. There won't be anything hindering it anymore um, once that happens. And that we'll get into next week. Lord willing. So with that, let's stand and be dismissed in prayer.